with the actual class. So welcome, my name is Steve Gerhardt. I'm the deputy city clerk for the city of Ann Arbor. Uh, I'm the one that you've all been uh, communicating with. Um, I'm the one that reached out to you uh, for recruitment. I'm the one that sent you your emails, letting you know uh, what precinct you've been assigned to. So a little basics on precinct assignments. All 53 precincts are open for this uh, election. Uh, while the city maintains 53 precincts, uh, those 53 precincts are spread across uh, 35 uh, physical locations. So we do have some locations that house multiple uh, precincts. So things like the Michigan Union, Community High, they would house two precincts in them. Because uh, we're still very much in the infancy of what seems to be a switch to Michigan being a more vote by mail state, uh, all precincts will have between 10 to 13 workers just because we really didn't know what the turnout in the precinct was going to be. It's one of those where uh, we're still staffing the precincts uh, with the old mindset of the precincts are going to be extremely busy and it doesn't seem to be that way. Official appointment emails were sent out to everybody that's been assigned uh, to a precinct on September 14th. Individuals uh, that are on the wait list as vacancies arise, uh, we will be moving individuals from that wait list up and you'll hear from me as those uh, vacancies occur. Uh, it could be up to and including election day, which is why we had individuals on the wait list take the training. When you commit it to working the election, I reached out and let you know that there was going to be a $25 bonus uh, for working the election. At this point, uh, that bonus has been upped to $100 to show our thanks for all of you for working this election. Now, getting back to my point of saying that your precincts will be extremely well equipped um, in the last presidential election, we only had 14,000 uh, absentee ballots issued in the city. Uh, we are now over 50,000 absentee ballots, which is, I mean, well over 50% of our active voter population here in the city. So considering uh, turnout in a presidential election, usually hovers around 60%. Uh, the vast majority of those have already voted in the precinct. So you can expect relatively light turnout in the precincts because all these individuals that are getting absentee ballots for the most part are also quickly getting them back into our office. I believe at last check last night, we were already approaching uh, close to 50% of those 50,000 ballots being returned to our office for processing on election day. So that's where we're at. So again, there's roughly uh, 30 to 40,000 uh, votes left to cast uh, spread out among the 50 three precincts. So, and that would be a hundred percent voter turnout, which we never have gotten to. All election inspectors must arrive to the precinct at 6 a.m. Make sure you have your cell phone on and set to ring when you get to the precinct. When I send out the links, uh, probably in about a week or so, I'm also going to be sending out a link to a cell phone stipend request. What the city does is in exchange for you allowing us to call you 
for you to use your phone to call us on election day. We provide you with a $5 bonus on election day. Uh, there's just a short form that you have to fill out and that form will be sent out when I send out all of the links on with for the training and uh, the uh, inspector manual again, all of that will be included in that email. Again, I would expect that in about a week or so. Each precinct will have a chairperson. The chairperson is your most experienced worker. They're going to be bringing uh, the critical supplies to the precinct with them, which is the zippered notebook, which contains all your important forms and documents. It's, uh, this is basically a trapper keeper, as well as the laptops, which contain all of your uh, voters information on them. One of the key things to keep in mind is that the doors to the precinct have to be open at 6am because anybody interested in observing the process has the right to do so starting at 6am. Voters don't start voting until 7 a.m. So there's that hour there for you to go ahead and get set up and ready to go. The first thing that your chairperson will do in the morning is they'll administer an oath to you so that you're officially sworn in as an election inspector on election day morning. That oath is very simple. You're just swearing to support the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the state of Michigan, and that you'll faithfully discharge the duties of the Office of Election Inspector. Briefly, I'm just gonna cover uh, the city's response to the current uh, COVID pandemic. Each precinct will be provided with hand sanitizers, gloves, mask, face shields, uh, a sanitizing solution of some sort, whether it be a Lysol type solution or Clorox wipes, as well as painter's tape so that you can mark social distancing uh, from the line leading up to the electronic poll book. Uh, you'll have three containers of hand sanitizer so that you can spread it throughout the room, one for the election inspectors, one for the voters, uh, and one kind of for in reserve. It's much better than in August when we provided just a giant gallon size container of it. But one thing I will keep uh, really stress which thankfully we didn't have any issues with in August, but I know other jurisdictions did, is it is critically important that anybody touching the ballots make sure that their hands are completely dry. The hand sanitizer is from our friends at Anheuser-Busch, so it is a little liquidy and liquid and paper don't exactly mix, especially when ballots are going through the tabulator and it has the ability to gum up a tabulator. Uh, and we want to avoid that when all possible. In addition to the PPE, each precinct will be provided uh, with a set of three sneeze guards. These sneeze guards are designed to um, be placed between the workers and the voters at the electronic poll book. Uh, the worker and the voter at the stack of ballots and the application to vote slash the tabulator station. So everywhere that voters and election inspectors are really uh, interacting with each other, there's that added layer of security by having the uh, plexiglass in between the two, uh, between the two. Here's a sample of what a precinct should look like. Uh, we do provide you uh, with uh, tape measures in your supply kits. So that way you can go ahead and make sure that to the best of your ability, 
you set up everything at least six feet apart. You know, critically important setting up those voting booths six feet apart and making sure that your line is managed with the six feet. Now you'll see, you really wanna kind of set your precinct up in a nice circular flow so that way you don't have voters crossing paths. It's easier to manage. So the first station that a voter walks in and sees is the application to vote station. This station doesn't really need to be manned. It's basically a table that has all of the applications to vote that a voter just goes in and fills out. However, if you have a line, you can start having somebody walk up and down the line with the applications to vote. That way voters can pre-fill them in as they're standing in line. It also allows you to check and make sure that everybody standing in line is in the correct line and that there's no confusion about whether or not they're registered to vote or they're in the right place. From that application to vote table, you'll move over and that's where the e-poll book or your electronic list of voters will be set up. That's where a plexiglass screen will be and the real first election inspector. That's where the voter is gonna take their application to vote, give it to that election inspector, show their photo identification, be checked in. Sitting next to that person is going to be the person that issues ballots. So they're gonna have the stack of ballots in front of them. So that way, again, behind plexiglass, they can hand the voter the ballot. Uh, the plexiglass is much like the bank teller style where it has the slot in the bottom for you to go ahead and pass the ballot through underneath. From there, the voter will take their ballot, go to the voting booth, and then they'll go to basically the third uh, station in the process, which is the stub verification and application to vote spindle. This is the person that as people are coming out of the voting booth, they're stopping, they're checking that person's application to vote to make sure that they still have the correct ballot. They're taking the stub off the ballot so it's now a secret ballot. And then they're directing them to put the ballot into the tabulator. They need to maintain at least 10 feet of separation between the tabulator and themselves. So again, more than social distance there, just for the privacy of the voter. You'll see there's two uh, areas marked out. The one really critical area to set up when you're thinking about the layout of your precinct is you'll see designated in yellow, the public area. Now the public area is where poll watchers, members of the media, anybody not voting that's just there to observe is going to be stationed during the course of the day. You wanna set it up somewhere that they have full sight lines of what's going on in the precinct. They're not behind you at the processing table. They're not behind any voting booths. They're not within 10 feet of the tabulator but they still have a unobstructed view of what's going on in the precinct. So again, kind of by the entrance exit doors is a good place to put that. And then behind the processing table, you'll see that there's an area designated for challengers. And we'll get into more information on what the difference between challengers and the public area is when we discuss poll watchers and challengers much later in the presentation. So voters are not required to wear a mask. We strongly encourage them in accordance with recent health orders from the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, we'll 
provide your precinct with extra mask to give to voters should they not be wearing one, but you cannot deny a person a ballot should they not be wearing a mask. Again, you're going to be able to get that person in and out of the precinct quicker by just giving them their ballot than trying to fight with them over whether or not they're wearing a mask. However, election inspectors, poll watchers, and challengers are all required to wear a mask in the precinct. Again, try to keep your contact with a voters to a minimum. So if you can avoid touching their photo identification, unless you absolutely need to, that's best. Again, you're just looking at it so you can have them hold it up to the plexiglass in between you and them at the e-poll book so that you can just see it. Again, with the large number of election inspectors that you have, Make sure that you're taking frequent breaks to wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Do keep in mind that while there are currently orders uh, regarding the limit to the size of crowds, these limits do not apply to polling locations. So you're not going to be trying to count how many people do I have in the room right now? Oh, I'm over. The limitation, um, voting is explicitly exempt from Michigan Department of Health and Human Services orders. Still trying to maintain social distancing at all times, but keep in mind there'll be certain activities during the course of the day where social distancing uh, can't be maintained, and that's where all the PPE comes into place. You'll have this uh, handy guide to sanitation on how frequently things should be sanitized, but pens after every voter, you'll have a clean and dirty pen cup so that way it's very clear which pens are which. And every so often just go ahead empty out that dirty pen cup and disinfect them using either Clorox, Lysol or alcohol wipe. Same with the voting booth, go through and disinfect those. Uh, the ballot tabulator itself, the tabulator itself is not something that voters really uh, touch. So unless they're touching it, uh, which is very uncommon because it's just basically you put your ballot in without touching it, uh, it doesn't need to be disinfected. Same with the voter assist terminal. Uh, that's something that's very rarely used and we'll get into what the voter assist terminal is later on in the presentation. The e-poll book, you'll wanna disinfect in between uh, each individual user. And finally, uh, your hands, if you're not wearing the gloves that we provide you, uh, you'll wanna go ahead and disinfect your hands every time uh, you exchange materials with a voter. But yes, it's perfectly okay to wear gloves in the um, polling location, which is why we provide them for you. Uh, what I will say is just make sure to um, practice good hygiene while wearing them. The gloves don't protect you from touching your eyes or nose. And also uh, practice the good hygiene when taking them off. Finger. Uh, thumb and uh, forefinger when taking them off, roll them off and dispose of them properly. So that way you're not just transferring all that bacteria right back onto your clean hands. Yes, uh, each precinct will have at least 50 masks. So that way, if a voter shows up without a mask and requests one, you can uh, give them one. No, election inspectors are not required to wear uh, gloves. The only thing you are required to wear are masks, everything else uh, we provide, you know, the gloves, the face shields. Um, it's there if you would like to use it. Uh, we, you know, we encourage it, but you're not required to wear the gloves, the face shields. You're just required to wear a mask.
Yes, you can absolutely. So again, um, we provide you with uh, PPE, but again, if you're much more comfortable uh, in your own PPE, uh, feel free to come in with your own. Um, I can tell you, I have a quite large head. So uh, the mask that we provide it in August, um, you know, because they go behind your ears. I can't stand a mask that goes behind my ears. I like something that wraps all the way around my head. Um, I was able to wear it for, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes before um, I got annoyed and was switching back into my own mask. So you can absolutely bring all of your own PPE but again, we are just providing it for you so that way you don't feel compelled to have to have your own. Uh, we are providing it for you. In terms of the manual, there will be uh, one printed copy of the manual in the zippered notebook, and there'll also be one spiral bound copy in the precinct. Uh, but if you want, uh, you can come pick up a printed copy of your own from City Hall uh, anytime that we're open uh, and that you can take with the precinct and that would be yours uh, for uh, eternity. Any other questions on uh, PPE, COVID protocols, things of that nature? So the photo on the slide is an example of the e poll book. You'll see on the photo in the upper um, right hand corner of the screen, there's this sticker. This sticker on each laptop will go ahead and indicate what precinct number it is, as well as the name. So when you open up the computer, it'll be quite obvious if you have the right computer, because not only will it say, hey, this is 4-7, but it'll also say that you're at Dickens School. So that way you can know, hey, yes, I'm at supposed to be at 4-7 and I'm sitting in Dickens School. So this is my laptop, great. One thing I will always stress is because we don't own all of the buildings in which precincts are housed, always plug your laptop in first when you're trying to set up the precinct to make sure that the plug that you are using throughout the course of the day is a functional outlet. There's nothing worse than getting a few hours into the course of the day think that you have an awesome layout for your precinct only to find out that that plug that you've been plugging your laptop in uh, isn't giving you any power and now your laptop's about to die so just check to see is the laptop running on uh, ac power which you'll just see a little charging symbol in the lower right hand corner of the screen so in addition to the laptop You'll have a card reader, which looks like this. Uh, what that does is it allows, uh, typically you would slide a driver's license through the um, card reader. And as long as it's a Michigan driver's license, it would automatically find the voter. Since again, we're stressing not to touch things unless you're wearing gloves and even then, because most people won't want you touching their driver's license with gloves. Um, I would either recommend just typing a voter's name in when you're searching for voters, or I've seen precincts that basically set this up so that it's outside of the plexiglass and allow the voters to swipe through much like a credit card reader at uh, Starbucks or something along those lines or that way they're still doing it and it's easier for you 
but you're not having to touch the person's driver's license and the voters not having to hand you their driver's license. Again, in the uh, sake of ease for you on election day, we do label everything for you. So each of the USB ports on the various types of laptops will tell you exactly what to plug into that port. So you'll see it says scan for where to plug in the scanner. Uh, it'll say mouse for where to plug in your mouse. There'll be a little arrow key indicating where to plug in your uh, secure flash drive. Uh, the on button, their power button will be uh, labeled with an on button. So again, we've tried to go through and make it as simple as possible. On the home screen of the computer, there'll only be three icons. There'll be the recycling bin, the e-poll book, which is what you'll want to go ahead and open. And uh, there'll be a electronic copy of the um, election inspector manual. So that way, if you wanted to pull it up and quickly search for it for something, it's a, a searchable PDF. So that way you can quickly click on it and say, hey, this is what I'm looking for. Great. It's easy to look for rather than having to flip through uh, the paper copy if you're trying to find something. So again, everything designed with simplicity and ease in mind. In terms of simplicity and ease in mind, this right here is a flash drive that we use for uh, secure uh, for storing all of the data from election day on. Um, the nice thing is these are encrypted flash drives. Our old encrypted flash drives that we just replaced used to require you as election inspectors to have a password and log into them prior to them being uh, secure. These new ones are programmed uh, directly to uh, the computer that you have in front of you. So the second that you plug this flash drive into the e-poll book that it's assigned to, it's going to go ahead and decrypt and be ready for use. It's a lot more secure because you don't know the password for these. So if somebody did walk off with it, they can't walk off with your sheets of password that would use that used to have these and have access to all the data that were saved on these. It's now they would have to also steal the laptop, which would be a lot more noticeable of a thing. Again, I've never seen somebody steal a flash drive or a laptop. So it's all hypothetical, but again, always working to make sure our elections are the most secure that they can be. At this point, this is going to be a second where please bear with me because this is known to have uh, technical glitches when I start to share the actual screen of electronic poll book. So if your screen stops showing what I'm about to share, please shoot me in the Q&A letting me know that it is not showing what I'm trying to show. Or if you lose sound again, please let me know right away. All right, so you should see that it shows encryption password, username, user password. On election day, you will each receive a letter that tells you what that encryption password is and what your unique username and user password is. Uh, usernames will all be in capital. So they'll all be all cap locks. Um, your username is typically going to be the first letter of your first name and then your entire last name. The only time that that is not the case 
is uh, if you have a hyphenated last name, I usually only take the first half of your last name just so that your username's a little bit shorter. Or if you have a last name that is shorter than four letters because your username has to be at least five characters long, I'll start adding letters from your first name. You'll receive these letters physically on election day morning at the precinct. Now your passwords, your passwords are going to be randomly generated eight character strong passwords. So they're just going to be a random string of upper and lower case and numbers. Now, what I will say is uh, please at the end of the election, do destroy this letter because much like a password to your banking account, this password is going to be yours in perpetuity for the e-poll book. So every future election, you will get that password in the morning on election day. I'm not asking you to remember it, but I am telling you that that's going to be your password moving forward. And I would hate to have that just casually tossed in the trash where somebody could pick it up. Now, what I will say is when you enter the encryption password, which should only be the first time in the morning, usually, um, I'm very much a hit enter on my keyboard kind of person when I'm entering passwords. Uh, if you incorrectly enter the password though, it's going to kind of put you in this vicious loop where it tells you the password's wrong and then hitting enter just kind of keeps trying to enter it. In which case you really need to make sure that you're using your mouse to stop the vicious cycle because a message will pop up letting you know the mess, the password was wrong and you'll have to hit okay to then try to enter the password. Um, it's a kind of weird vicious circle. Now, can everybody see the actual e poll book itself? Okay. Now, the e poll book itself, I'm going to run through um, the basics of what the screen looks like. And so, in the upper left hand corner, you have the election date. So for this election, we're in the November 5th, 2019, November consolidated election. And we are working in the wonderful township of Bohemia. Next to that, you'll see that we're in precinct one. On election day, you're obviously looking for this to say November 3rd, 2020, November general, city of Ann Arbor. For precincts, because we have wards, the way this will read is it will say something like 03003 if you were in precinct 33, but it's just going to read what ward you're in followed by what precinct you're in. Again, that number should match the sticker that was listed in the upper right hand corner of your screen. In the center portion of the screen, starting from left to right, 
you have your list of voters. This precinct is everybody that is eligible to vote in your precinct. You see down in the lower left hand corner, it tells you how many voters you have. So I have almost 1700 voters in my precinct. I have this voter search, which is where I want my cursor to be whenever I'm trying to scan a driver's license or type in a name. I also have next to this precinct, I have other. And other gives me the ability to search all the registered voters in the city of Ann Arbor. So I just have to either scan the driver's license or start to type in the person's last name. With each keystroke, it starts to cut down on the list of names that I have. So in this case, each TR that I put, so if I get down to TRI, you'll see that I'm down to Trinkle. And I know that I only have the one voter on which I'm looking for. Finally, I have the unlisted tab. And the unlisted tab is for voters that have to be manually added into the e-poll book. And these are voters that register in our office after 4 p.m. on Monday and decide to come back out to the precinct to vote. Uh, so it's very rare that you actually use this unlisted tab. You always want to make sure that when you're done using the other or unlisted tab, that you switch back to this precinct. The reason being, otherwise, when you go to look up the next voter that actually belongs in your precinct, you're not going to be able to find them because it's going to be looking everywhere else in the city, but your actual precinct. And the easy way to tell that you're looking in the right place is you see that this background is gray. When you're looking in this precinct, you'll see that the background is white and you wanna see that white background to clue you in that you're looking at the right list of voters. Also, the other won't actually show names unless you have something typed in as opposed to this precinct, which will. Individuals in the other tab, all you're doing in this other tab is once you locate them, you're just looking to see, hey, this is what your polling location is and you're sending them to that polling location so that they can vote on election day. It's one of our other 53 precincts, so they just need to drive to that precinct or go to that precinct in order to vote. They're not eligible to vote in your uh, precinct. Finally, on the uh, far right hand side, you have the list of voters. During the course of the day, every time you add a voter, that voter's name is going to show up in order here. And this list is just gonna continue to grow. Uh, this list on the right hand side is not interactive. So you can't click on a name here to be taken back to their voters record. Uh, you just have to, the only list that's interactive is this one over here where you can click on names in order to bring up their voter records. This one is not, it's just a static list of who's already voted in the precinct. So let's go ahead and get started with showing you what it actually looks like to process voters. So I'm just gonna go ahead and choose that Caitlin McQVF is standing in front of me. And Caitlin hands me her uh, application to vote. 
I confirm on her application to vote that yes, she's really at 25829 Dishnell Road. Great. So I'm just going to lock this voter's record, which is the first step you need to take before you can perform any action. If a voter scans in their driver's license and they're found, they're automatically going to be locked in. So you don't have to take that step. The computer takes the step for you. Otherwise, uh, you just need to lock that voter before you can do anything. From there, you see you have a correct a couple different options. You have the ability to issue a regular ballot, an envelope provisional ballot, a challenge ballot, and then you have other actions over here. Or down here, you have the ability to unlock this voter if you realize that you locked in the wrong voter. And you have the ability to make uh, voter remarks which would be remarks tied directly to that voter. But as long as Caitlin doesn't have anything, uh, so she doesn't have any question marks next to her name, she's just going to go ahead and be issued a regular ballot. So you'll simply click regular ballot now for your first voter of the day, this, uh, it's gonna pop up and it's going to be blank and you're going to have to physically type in what ballot number this voter is going to be assigned. From there, with very few exceptions, it's going to go ahead and automatically keep track in the, uh, going to keep track of what ballot number they're issued. So I'm just going to say that Caitlin, she's my first voter. My first ballot number is 101. So I'm just going to type that in because she's my first voter and hit OK to issue her her ballot. You'll now see that Caitlin shows up on my list of voters as voter number one, ballot number 101. This is the information I would communicate to the person sitting next to me with the stack of ballots so that they can record this on their application to vote. They need to know what the voter number is and what the ballot number is. Now you'll see there's three cases or three places where you can tell that Caitlin has now voted. First, on the uh, left side of the screen next to her name, it now shows up REG, indicating that she's been issued a regular ballot. In the center section, in the voter status, she's now shows being issued regular ballot 101 in the precinct. Her voting status is voted in the precinct using a regular ballot. And finally, she shows up on your list of voters having been issued ballot 101. Now, voters that show up with question marks require an additional look to see what that question mark means prior to them being issued a ballot. The nice thing is <clears throat> in your election inspector manual, there's a one page guide on what each of these individual status flags mean and what it is that the voter must do or what needs to be done prior to the voter being issued a ballot. So the way it works is you have a voter such as Jonathan Bradford. You see down below 
that Jonathan must show ID before voting, a federal requirement. So what this means is Jonathan registered to vote through the mail and on Jonathan's application, he did not provide us with a Michigan driver's license or state ID number or the last four digits of his social security number. And this is his first time voting. So because Jonathan's never really shown up in person anywhere and we have no identifying factors to prove that Jonathan's a real person, Jonathan needs to show us acceptable forms of ID in order to vote or if he doesn't have a form of acceptable ID, uh, he has to go through and show us uh, something that provides his residency, such as utility bill, a paycheck stub, a bank statement, a governmental form or letter, something that proves that he's really him listing his address. Or if he really doesn't have anything at all, then that would be the case of him being a provisional envelope ballot that doesn't go through the tabulator. But yes, this is only for first time voters that show up that haven't, when they filled out their application, they did it through the mail and they didn't provide us with the last four digits of their social security number. It's increasing, it's a, it's extremely uncommon that somebody doesn't put the last four digits of their social security number. So this is not a common thing for you to see. Other things that you may see is voters like this. He has two statuses. He's to be verified confirmation notice which means that we sent a notice to the voter because we're not sure that he really lives at 404 or 4403 Railroad Grade Road. So the voter would have to verbally confirm that that is really his address. And you see that there's a second part of his uh, notice here that shows that uh, he needs to sign a voter registration card. So you would just have that voter fill out a new voter registration because when he filled out his voter registration, he did not sign. Mostly what you're going to see on election day are these to be verified confirmation notices where we're not sure that the person really lives there. The way voting uh, voter registration works is when we register you to vote, we send you a voter ID card. That voter ID card really is the last step in the process. Yes, it serves as a helpful thing for you because it lets you know where you go to vote. You don't actually need it for voting purposes, but really what it serves as is it allows us to prove that you live at the address that you say you do. If it bounces back to us, you we then put you on this to be verified status. And in this state case, you would just say to the voter, first you'd be looking at their address and you're saying, you know, you're looking at that application and you're looking hey, does that application match with what it says? And then you would just say, if it does match, you would just say, hey, just confirming that you do reside at 5783 Pengor Road. Just a very simple, you know, yes, no answer. Now, if Carrie does confirm that that is her correct address, when you lock this voter's record, you can make a voter remark and simply say voter confirmed address. 
because this is a voter remark, it's tied directly to that voter's uh, voter record. So when we print the report, it's going to show Carrie Ann Davis with that remark. So we'll know exactly who it is that you're talking about. So that's a perfectly acceptable, short, brief, quick note to put there. And then you would just go ahead because Carrie confirmed that yes, she's really good. You go ahead, issue her her ballot. You'll see that it went ahead and already numbered it for me. I didn't have to type it in a second idea, a second time. Correct. To confirm an address, it's only verbal confirmation, no proof needed. Uh, because again, uh, they've already, the proof was previous when they filled out their voter registration. Uh, they signed an affidavit swearing under uh, penalty of perjury that all the information was correct. It's just uh, they're uh, saying that the information was correct, that it was the post office. Um, yes, you'll want to go ahead and say, just confirming you that you live at 570 the address. Uh, now for individuals that don't, that for the homeless population, um, we have a large number of them that are registered at the uh, Delana Center, but also uh, in the city we have um, four different uh, non-traditional addresses in the city. So um, there's like four different street corners uh, throughout the city that uh, we can register people at for that. If they say that they don't live there, as long as the address is uh, still within the city of Ann Arbor limits, they're still allowed to vote one last time in their old precinct. You would just have them fill out a voter registration form so that way we can get them registered at their correct address for the next election. If their new address is outside the city's address. Um, in that case, then you would have to you would have to ask them when they moved. You have a sixty day grace window to vote in your old jurisdiction one last time. But if they moved more than sixty days prior to the election, then they would have to go to their new jurisdiction and re-register on election day. The only time you really have to ask for proof of ID is for the federal ID requirement if they don't have an acceptable photo ID and we'll get into what acceptable photo ID. And yes, if somebody was subject to the federal ID requirement, they could show you uh, forms electronically. The other thing, there's two more things I wanna show out of uh, the e poll book is first, um, spoiling a ballot. Spoiling a ballot uh, will probably be really uncommon for this election because uh, most people are really set, uh, know how they want to vote. So you shouldn't have too many people making mistakes on ballots, uh, requiring them to get a new one. Uh, that was uh, spoiling ballots were really common in August when you had to vote only in one political party's uh, primary, but now that it's November and you can vote for um, 
anyone that you so choose. Uh, in that case, uh, the only real time that you're spoiling ballots is for the individual that gets a little carried away when filling in the boxes on the ballot. And um, they uh, fill in three instead of a vote for two, something along those lines. So it's, it's going to be extremely uncommon that you have uh, spoiled ballots. But if you do have a spoiled ballot, it's a kind of multi-step process. So first you would relook up that voter's name on the list of voters. So I'm gonna say Caitlin spoiled her ballot. So I'm gonna go over to Caitlin. I'm gonna lock her voter's record in. I'm gonna say she spoiled a ballot under other action. It's gonna automatically fill in what ballot number she was spoiled. It's gonna tell me the spoiling of the ballot is complete. I'm gonna to have to lock this voter's record one more time and issue her whatever type of ballot she received to begin with. And again, it's going to automatically say what her new ballot number is. And I'll just go ahead and say yes. So you'll see Caitlin, her voter number doesn't change. She was still the first voter that came through the door, but her ballot number now changes. It just adds a second line to show she's still your first voter. She just now has a second ballot that she's been issued. So on her application to vote, you would simply cross out the old ballot number and uh, write the new one in. So this is before she puts the ballot in the tabulator, she realizes she made a mis or she goes to put the ballot in the machine, the machine rejects it. She realizes she wants to fix the mistake that she made on her ballot. She would come back in, spoil that ballot and be given a new one. Okay. The system does show you uh, whether or not a person was sent an absentee ballot. Uh, so you'll see that uh, in the system, William Heard here, his status, he's got the red question mark next to his name, and his status was he was sent absentee ballot 1003, sent by clerk, voter must surrender ballot or submit affidavit. So in that case, um, what you're going to do is if the voter has the ballot in their hands, you're gonna have them basically step out of the line. If there's a line, somebody's going to call our office. We're gonna go ahead and give you verbal confirmation that William is good to go ahead and vote. And then you're gonna go ahead and issue William a ballot just like normal. When you go to issue William a ballot, it's going to tell you that an absentee ballot has already been sent out. So it's gonna prompt you with that extra warning just to let you know that William already has a ballot. So you'll just continue through that. On our end, what we would do when you call us, which is this is why it's important that you call us, even if the voter has the ballot in their hands for you to surrender is uh, we're going to go ahead and reject the ballot. Once we make sure that they haven't already turned the ballot in, we're going to go ahead and reject the ballot. So that way, if we get the ballot back in our office, anytime after you call us, um, we know not to go ahead and process it because we know that that voter has already voted in the precinct. 
The reason why this is going to be especially important in this election is back on election day or back on September 24th, we mailed out close to 40,000 ballots. On September 24th, there was also a large push for people to hurry up and go get their ballot, despite the fact that we were putting them in the mail that day. So some people that were a little over eager, untrusting of the post office, uh, came into our office and uh, were spoiled and given a new ballot. So in that case, they could physically have two ballots in their possession. We know in our system to only count one of them, but they could uh, drop it off. They could be holding that ballot in their hands. You wouldn't know the difference of what one's really the good one. You just see a ballot, you think, oh, this is their ballot. They're here to surrender it. I should probably let them vote not knowing that they turned in a second ballot at City Hall after 4 p.m. when we loaded up the e-poll book, the one that actually is valid in the system. So just to make sure that everything's on the up and up, you do wanna go ahead and call. You would take that ballot if they have it to surrender, you'll have a uh, orange envelope that says AV envelopes, and you'll go ahead and put it in there and it'll get returned to City Hall with all the rest of your voted ballots at the end of the night. A voter cannot uh, drop their ballot off with you for tabulation on election day. Uh, they have to go ahead and if they want it to count, they have to either drop it off at City Hall or one of the five ballot drop boxes throughout the course of the city by 8 p.m. on election day. Those ballots will, those boxes will be collected right at 8 p.m. So everything that's in them will go ahead and get counted, but they can't just drop them off with you. You're not a collection location for absentee ballots. If they come in, they have to go ahead, uh, surrender that ballot and get a new precinct ballot to vote. If they say they never received their ballot, they left their ballot at home or, you know, they just did something to destroy their ballot, you'll have an affidavit in your supplies that voter simply fills out that affidavit saying that they either never received their ballot or they destroyed their ballot. Again, you'll call us to confirm that we never received the ballot. We'll go ahead and make sure that if we do get it back after we speak to you, that we don't count it. And then they'll sign that affidavit. You'll put it in your return to local clerk envelope. And from there, you'll let the voter vote just like normal. The number that you'll call is on the cover of your poll book and would be posted in many, many places on election day. So spoiled ballots, just like the AV ballots, there's an envelope that they'll go into uh, that you'll keep behind the processing table. So that way at the end of the night, they'll get sealed up and sent into uh, sent or returned back to City Hall with your voted ballots. Uh, there's an envelope that says spoiled ballots. That way the voters ballots not just out there um, for everybody to see, but uh, it's still securely uh, possessed. Uh, nobody's going to be starting with 101. Uh, what you're going to see is when you open up the laptop in the morning, you're gonna have a sheet of paper on the keyboard that has a big bright red um, number on it that tells you exactly what ballot number you're going to be starting with. 
Uh, it depends on how many absentee ballots that we've issued for uh, your precinct. Any other questions on the e poll book before we switch back over to the uh, PowerPoint? Okay. Uh, the citizen flag just means that uh, when they filled out their uh, <clears throat> application, they did not um, complete the citizenship question, which in that case, they need to uh, complete a new voter registration, ensuring that yes, they check that they're a United States citizen, um, and then uh, they can go ahead and proceed to vote as normal. Uh, your number should easily align between the e-poll book and the ballot stack because you have two people communicating all throughout the course of the day. Um, and we'll get into uh, tricks to make sure that you don't uh, get off kilter. Uh, no, people shouldn't be coming into the precinct to verify their ballots been received. Uh, we send out emails uh, to let people know their ballots been received and more again, um, they, have, uh, will be calling our office. Uh, again, if you see that their status is sent slash received by the clerk and they come in, then in that case, uh, then because it's already being processed on election day, they vote it there's no chance for them to go ahead and change their mind, their ballots as good as already in the tabulator on election day. No, you don't need your voter registration card. Again, that card is more so just for your information to tell you where to go vote and for ours as the final link in the uh, puzzle to make sure that you really live at the address where you live. You don't need it for voting purposes. If they don't have a flag, there's nothing they need to confirm. They literally just get locked in, issued a regular ballot, they're good to go, which is what the majority of your voters, well, I would say the majority of your voters would not have status flags except uh, that's not going to be the case for this election because the majority of your status flags are going to be sent slash received absentee ballots. So yes, uh, your list of voters really probably will look like my list of voters in the sandbox because so many people um, have already been sent absentee ballots. So yeah, you probably will see uh, red question marks that look like this. Uh, typically, you would have a lot less question marks in a real precinct. Um, again, if you have a person that comes in that goes, oh, I don't have my voter registration card, just let them know they don't need that, that they only need photo identification to vote. Um, for this election, no, um, we haven't had a large request, a uh, number of people uh, to spoil their ballot and change their mind uh, in March and in August. Uh, yes, especially in March with the presidential primary with so many people, candidates dropping out. Uh, we had uh, 
the um, a lot of ballots that we had to spoil and reissue. Um, so in that case, but for November, uh, most people know um, that who they're voting for. So we've had very few ballots that we've had to spoil. Oh, okay. So if the flag says sign registration card, it's not their uh, voter ID card. It's they would fill out and sign a new voter registration. So we have voter registration forms in your supplies. They would just fill out a new voter registration because they didn't sign their voter registration. Same with if they didn't check the citizenship and it was uh, confirmed citizenship, you would have them fill out a new voter registration confirming that they check yes, that they're a citizen. It's just they're completing a new piece of paperwork so that we have that proper documentation back in our office. It's not the voter register, it's not their, um, voter registration or voter identification card that they're concerned about. It's you're literally having them fill out a new voter registration. They're already registered. It's just, we're getting that proper documentation in place for after the fact to say, yes, this voter really is good to go. Uh, they signed their voter registration form. We have a signature on file for them now. Yes, they really are a citizen. It's, it's not, it has nothing to do with their ID card. It has everything to do with having them complete a new voter registration form. So transgender um, voters, uh, if the gender has changed, um, again, uh, operate under tech. Um, no need to call the voter out as long as you can still tell that it is uh, the voter. Um, then just go ahead and process. No need to call City Hall, anything like that. So again, just be tactful with the way that you handle that. All right. Switch back to my PowerPoint. So again, in the morning, you're gonna basically wanna break off into little teams to focus on the various items that you need to get set up in the morning. You know, one team focusing on setting up the e-poll book, one team setting up the tabulator, which is the a machine that's responsible for counting the ballots, uh, one team responsible for setting up the voter assist terminal, which is basically a wonderful giant mechanical pencil, uh, which is our ADA compliant device. Uh, and then a team setting up voting booths and just making sure that all the little things in the precinct are good to make it easy for the voter. But when you're setting up the tabulator, the very first thing you want to do when setting up the tabulator is you'll have a paper poll book. And on the cover of the paper poll book, there'll be a serial number and a seal number recorded for both the tabulator and for the um, voter assist terminal. And you just wanna make sure that both the pieces of equipment are the right piece of equipment that have been assigned to your precinct. For the serial number, you'll see that there's this little sticker that's on the cover of the suitcase. That means that you just look at this and see, yes, this is the right piece of equipment for my precinct. The seal number is this little blue pull tight seal and you'll wanna to check to see that that seal number is also correctly recorded on the cover of your paper poll book. And what this does, uh, it means 
that doing uh, that nobody has tampered with the flash drive that is inside the uh, compartment here. Since we loaded it, the machine, we tested the machine, and we sent it out to the precinct, this is the extra layer of security to make sure that what we tested and made sure was working is secure and that it uh, continues to be secure until 8 p.m. on election day. So it's very important that you don't cut the seal until after the polls are closed and it's time to remove the flash drive from the tabulator. It's the same on the voter assist terminal. What I will say is if you're in a location uh, that is a dual precinct, so you know one of our locations that has two precincts in it, uh, then you will only have one uh, voter assist terminal for the two precincts. So again, this will be shared between those two precincts, but again, you'll just confirm that yes, this is the correct device for both uh, teams by checking the serial number and that seal number that protects the programming inside. Another thing I wanna say is uh, because both of them are the same setup, this uh, kind of gray smoke plastic cover is the printer on both devices. On your tabulator in the morning, it's gonna go ahead in um, and print a totals tape that or a zero tape that shows that there really are zero votes that have been recorded so that you're starting with a fresh, clean, non uh, rigged election. And in order to show that we started with zero and we ended the night with however many votes that the voters put in the tabulator, you want to make sure that that tape stays there. So when the tape prints out and all the election inspectors sign, there's a little lever down here in this little indent that you can kind of see. If you lift it up, you can roll the tape back up and hide it underneath this cover. That way it's out of sight, out of mind, and no voter tries to walk off with your tabulator tape. So that way we have it and we can prove we had zero votes in the morning and this is how many total votes we got during the course of the day. The next thing you wanna do when you're setting up your uh, tabulator is you'll have a, a black key that opens up uh, the doors to your ballot box. You just wanna to check to make sure that there's no ballots inside your ballot box and that you're starting with a nice, fresh, empty ballot box. The front door opens up the main container and this is where all the ballots will fall during the course of the day. So they drop through this slot in the tabulator. This is where your tabulator would sit and they just fall down this slot straight into this wide open expanse. Uh, and second, on the back side, there's a little half door that drops down. And all there's a little uh, gray canvas bag that hold, that hangs down. And what it does is if for some reason your tabulator was to go uh, down for any length of time during the course of the day, there's a slot on the front of your tabulator, uh, the actual ballot box itself that voters can lift up and insert their ballots and those ballots would get dr uh, deposited directly into this ballot bag. And two election inspectors of opposite political parties at the end of the night would go ahead, pull these ballots out and make sure to run them through the tabulator again after 8 p.m. once the polls are closed. So you're just looking to make sure that you have zero ballots in your machine.
I'm going to show a couple videos here. The first is setting up the tabulator. Uh, each precinct will have their own tabulator. The tabulators are only programmed to accept uh, ballots from your precinct. So if you're in a precinct such as uh, 4757 at Dickin, uh, the 47 tabulator will only accept ballots for uh, 47. So if somebody crossed the gym and tried to put their 57 ballot in the 47 tabulator, I wouldn't accept it. It would tell you that the, you know, the barcode was wrong. The machines are only designed to accept your ballots for your precinct. The voter assist terminal, on the other hand, is basically a giant mechanical pencil that allows vo uh, voters that either just want to use it or have uh, disabilities that prevent them from voting a regular ballot to mark their ballot uh, privately and securely. And what it does is it prints them a brand new ballot uh, to be put through the tabulator instead of a regular ballot that they may struggle to vote on their own. Uh, and that allows you to choose which uh, ballot style that they're being issued. So there's only one of them per um, polling location. Again, they aren't a very widely used uh, piece of equipment. We'll start with the video on opening the tabulator. And remove the power brick and power cord located inside the storage compartment. Then close the compartment and case. Plug the power cord into the power brick. And then plug the power brick into the back of the Verity scan, flat side up. Open the Verity scan case and lock the lid brace into place. Unlock. Unlatch and remove the tablet. Seat the tablet in the cradle. Tilt it back. Lock it in place. And check the seal. Attach privacy screens to each side of the ballot box. Plug the power cord into AC power. A green light should illuminate on the power brick when AC power is present. Now press the red button on the back of the Verity scan to power it on. Opening the poles. Check the battery and AC power indicators on the screen and confirm that you are running on AC power. Select Print Zero Report. Check the zero report. On the screen, check the ballot and sheet count as well as the date and time. Select Open the Polls. Enter the Open Polls code and then select Accept. The Open Polls report will print. File to zero and open polls reports according to local guidelines. 
VerityScan is ready to scan ballots when you see the Ready to Use screen. System Polling Place Training for Verity TouchWriter. The Verity voting system includes several different polling place devices. The number and type of devices used at each polling place may vary. In this video, you will learn about the Verity TouchWriter ballot marking device. Each Verity device is contained in an integrated case. The device case includes a label that identifies the type of device. The Verity TouchWriter has a red A label and a black W label. Verity TouchWriter Verity TouchWriter is an accessible ballot marking device. Once a voter has finished voting and reviewed their choices, they will then print a paper ballot marked with their choices from the attached printer. The voter then retrieves and casts the ballot, either using Verity Scan or into a ballot box to be processed centrally. Voters may make their ballot selections with TouchWriter using either the touchscreen or using Verity Access. Verity Access is an audio tactile interface, or ATI, intended for voters that cannot or prefer not to use the touchscreen. Verity Access includes two connection ports. The left connection port is for headphones, while the right connection port is for any dual switch input device, such as tactile switches or sip and puff devices. Setting up the ballot printer. Set up the table for your ballot printer and set the ballot printer on the table. Plug the square end of the USB printer cable into the printer. The flat end will be plugged into the Verity TouchWriter. Insert the printer power cord into the printer and the other end into a power outlet. Load the ballot printer with appropriate ballot paper for your election. Do not power on the printer at this time. Setting up the voting booth. The Verity TouchWriter booth comes in a fabric transport bag. Remove booth parts from the transport bag. A complete set of booth parts includes the booth table, rear leg assembly, front leg extensions, and privacy screens. Release bungee cords holding the booth legs, if present. Unfold the legs from the booth table. Pull on the handle and lift to lock the legs into place. Attach the front leg extensions. Press the metal buttons to attach each leg and lock them into place. Attach the rear leg assembly. Press the metal buttons to attach and lock into place. Turn the booth over to set up the Verity Touch Rider. Setting up the Verity Touch Rider. Set the Verity Touch Rider on top of the booth, aligning foot pads with the indentations. The handle on the front of the touch rider should face the same direction as the handle on the booth. Stand at the front of the booth. Reach under the front of the booth top and push the latch away from you to secure the touch rider to the booth. Open the case and remove the power brick and power cord from the storage compartment. Close the compartment and case. Plug the power cord into the power brick, and then plug the power brick into the back of the Verity Touch Rider, flat side up. Plug the flat end of the USB printer cable from the ballot printer into the back of the Verity Touch Rider, with the notch facing up. Open the Verity TouchWriter case 
and lock the lid brace in place. Unlock. Unlatch and remove the tablet. Seat the tablet into the cradle. Tilt it back and then lock it into place. Attach privacy screens to both sides of the booth. Verify the tamper seal on the locked compartment above the printer. Plug the power cord into AC power. A green light should illuminate on the power brick when AC power is present. Now press the switch. On the bottom right side of the ballot printer to power it on. Now power on the Verity Touch Rider by pressing the red button on the back of the device. If your jurisdiction uses the auto ballot barcode reader, wait until the Touch Rider finishes powering up and displays the Print Zero Report screen. Then connect the auto ballot barcode reader to the USB connection located on the locked compartment above the report printer. Connect headphones to the Verity Access Controller. Plug the headphones into the headphone port on the top left of Verity Access. The port on the top right of the Verity Access may be used for optional tactile switches sip and puff, or any other dual switch input device. Opening the poles. To open poles, first check the battery and AC power indicators on the screen and confirm that you are running on AC power. Select Print Zero Report. Check the zero report. On the screen, Check the ballot or sheet count and the date and time. Select Open the Polls. Enter the Open Polls code and then select Accept. The Open Polls report will print. File the zero and Open Polls reports according to local guidelines. When the device is ready to be used for marking ballots, the Ready for Use screen will display. All right, so just a couple quick points I want to make from the training videos is <clears throat> uh, one, uh, they, they show tearing off the tape from the tabulator. Please, please, please don't do it. We need to keep that uh, tucked away under that little gray cover. So that way we have the full results showing we start it with zero, we end it with X number of votes. Uh, the tape from the touch writer can be torn off. Uh, simply because the touch writer is just a mechanical pencil. That tape in your on the morning of the election, when you run your opening tape, uh, may show something other than zero, uh, simply because when we test them, there's no way for us to zero out that piece of equipment. Uh, and that's perfectly fine. Again, the touch writer doesn't actually record votes. It's simply just a giant mechanical pencil that marks ballots for voters uh, to then be taken to the tabulator for tabulation. It's your tabulator that needs to be zero so that you know that there's no votes recorded. The mechanical pencil voter assist terminal uh, is something that uh, you have and it doesn't need to be zero. The other thing uh, is in the video because it is just from the vendor. Uh, they show that there's a barcode scanner on the voter assist terminal. Uh, we don't utilize those in Michigan. I'm not really sure what those are even used for, uh, but you won't need that. Um, if you have any uh, issues with paper jams or anything like that, uh, in your zippered notebook, you'll have what is called uh, a goldenrod sheet which has a number for 
uh, your precinct coordinator, who is an individual that's assigned uh, to a small number of precincts that is responsible for uh, the tabulator and other uh, issues like that in your precinct. Uh, there's uh, many layers of support for you. We have IT support, we have uh, precinct support, and then we have lawyer support for this election. So there, there's many different layers of backup support that we have available for you. But an event of a failure, uh, that's when you would go ahead, have voters continue to use the auxiliary bin so that they're still putting their ballot in the tabulator. They're not um, going through and backing up the line even further. Uh, and they're not just standing around with their voted ballots, but you would wanna call that person right away so they can come out and help you fix the problem. Setting up the voting booths. Uh, the voting booths are very uh, easy to set up. They're basically uh, some metal legs that snap together, a two piece metal leg that snaps together. Uh, you flip them upside down and there's four little rubber grommets in which you insert the legs. Uh, you do have some handicap accessible, wheelchair accessible booths, which just have uh, extender legs in the front to allow the legs to be wider out. Uh, again, what I recommend doing is setting up one booth and using that as a workstation as you build the rest of your booths. It makes it uh, easier, gives you a kind of working platform to which to go down the line and build your voting booths. Uh, they can be a little tricky to build just because of the nature of the legs. I don't know if anybody ever remembers building the old tents with the lovely aluminum poles, but it's that same kind of concept. Uh, so they're tricky, but they're uh, all in all, they're a wonderful stable product once you get them together. The other thing we have uh, for use in the precinct is, that's another reason why uh, we offer the cell phone stipend, is we have a line tracker application or website, and we'll send the link out to this website uh, the night before the election. We send out one final email. I usually try to schedule it for around 8 p.m. just so that it's fresh in your email with any last minute updates, uh, last minute reminders about the election and also the link to this website. You as election inspectors uh, have this very simple, easy to use election inspector line tracker website. It is password protected and we'll provide you with that password in the email. Well, when you log in, you just choose what precinct it is that you're reporting the line for and it takes you to a screen that looks like this, where you just enter how many people are standing in line to get to the e-poll book, and then you hit submit. We ask that each precinct has somebody submitting the uh, number of voters in line at least once an hour. And the reason why is once you submit this, on your side and the election inspectors, voters will be able to go on to our city's website and see how many people are standing in line and how many, what that means in terms of how long they're going to go expect to stand in line when they get to the precinct. It would go here and show what time this was last updated. So again, if it was three hours old, that's not really providing a useful tool for the voters to try to make their decision based on. So again, we're asking at least once an hour, if not more. On this website, you also have the ability in the upper right-hand corner to report non-urgent problems directly to the clerk's office. Uh, so this would be things uh, like you're starting to run low on supplies, but you have at least an hour plus lead time before you run out of things. Um, election inspectors not showing up, but you know that you're well equipped for the day, things of that nature. This is really where you want to report those problems. Now, the general election, here's a kind of preview of the front page of the ballot. Some things to know, 
Uh, voters have three options when completing uh, the partisan section of their ballot. There's three sections of the ballot. There's a partisan section, there's a nonpartisan section, and on the back page of the ballot, there's the proposal section. For the partisan section, uh, voters can vote a straight party, which they just need to fill in the one box and that one box for whatever party they choose would vote for all the candidates of that party and it would take them all the way down to the nonpartisan section, which is the midpoint of section of column four. Or they can vote a split ticket, which is where they say they mainly prefer a political party. So they vote for a straight party up here, but for certain races, they like candidates of a different party. So whatever race they go in and choose a different candidate for, it would go ahead and override their straight party choice and choose what they marked in those individual races. Or they can completely ignore the straight party section and just go in and fill in the individual races on their own. The nonpartisan and proposal section of the ballot have to be voted separately. Uh, they always have the option if they don't want to vote a section to just completely skip it. <clears throat> this is a question that we get a lot with people that are concerned about them uh, spoiling their ballot is what happens if they vote for a straight party and then still go in and mark all the candidates of the same party is it an overvote? Nope. What the machine is designed to do is it will read this and then, but if it sees votes down here, it's designed to go ahead and read this and take the results of the individual races over the partisan section. So that case, it's going ahead and it's looking at the individual races over the partisan section. So even if you chose one party here and voted for all the candidates here of that same political party, it's not an overvote. It's still just going to credit the one vote to each of the candidates that you chose here. Another thing that has recently changed are voters are now allowed to take a photo of their voted ballot in the voting booth. Uh, the voter cannot appear in the photo along with um, the ballot. Um, so it's basically, you're literally just snapping a quick photo of your ballot to, you know, have for, you know, prosperity's sake to show that yes, in the 2020 presidential election, I really did vote for the candidate of my choice. <clears throat> Under state law, these photos cannot be shared until you're outside that 100 foot no campaigning buffer. It doesn't affect any other prohibitions on photography in the voting location. So you can't take any uh, photographs in the precinct itself. So in the actual, uh, so if you're set up in a gym, you can't take any photographs in the gym uh, if you're a voter, except for that ballot selfie or that ballot, uh, you know, picture of your ballot. But what we have done, because we do know that we're a very um, social uh, group is we have set up selfie stations in each precinct, which are basically a uh, laminated backdrop that have the city of Ann Arbor's logo along with uh, an I Vote It sticker in a repeating pattern so that you can set them up in the hallway leading into your precinct. That way voters can take a photo before or after voting. Uh, they could use a sample ballot, but they can't, it can't be a vote it sample ballot. Um, but they can just take that quick I voted picture to prove that, you know, they vote it and show, you know, yes, um, 
you know, I vote it. Uh, I can tell you that this is now the uh, second or third election that we've had. Um, we've not had issues uh, with individuals taking photos. Um, it's one of those things of, um, Uh, if you see the, you know, um, camera hanging above the uh, voting booth where they're obviously taking a selfie that includes um, them in it, then in that case, I would just gently remind the voter of the requirement that they not appear in the photo with it. But for the most part, you know, I don't think many people are really taking the photo of uh, the ballots. Uh, everything we've seen, because we do encourage voters to tag us using hashtag A2 votes, is they're using uh, the selfie stations that we set up in the hallway uh, to just get that uh, social media ready uh, photograph of them in the hallway. Uh, yes, absolutely. If you tell somebody, if you see somebody uh, in the line taking photos, you can definitely remind them uh, that uh, photography in the precinct is uh, against the law. So applications to vote. Uh, before every vot voter is given a ballot, they have to complete an application to vote. Uh, and show photo identification or uh, sign the affidavit on the back of the application saying that they do not have acceptable photo identification. Um, everybody's eligible to sign that affidavit with the exception of the people that are subject to uh, the federal ID requirement. They could still sign it, but they would have to produce some other type of uh, ID before being eligible to vote uh, or to have the ballot go through the tabulator. But basically what happens is the voter just comes in, they print their name, their date of birth and their address, and then they go ahead and sign. And this is what they bring to you at the e-poll book. This is what you're going to compare the name and the address to in the e-poll book to make sure that you look up the correct voter. Acceptable photo IDs have to be current with the exception of Michigan driver's licenses or state ID. Uh, every other photo identification has to be current. Michigan driver's license or state ID can be expired. But acceptable photo ID include driver's license or personal identification card from any state. A federal or state governmental issued ID. A US passport or passport card, a student ID from a high school, college, or university, so very popular in Ann Arbor, as the use of M card, M cards from students. Again, keeping in mind, uh, faculty and staff uh, cannot use their M cards, and it's very clear on the M card which is a student's versus which are faculty and staff. You can also use a military ID card or a tribal identification card. But again, if for some reason a voter does not have photo identification, it's not the end of the world. They simply just fill out this affidavit on the back. They print their name, they sign saying, I don't have photo identification. Not having photo identification could be as simple as I decided to walk up to the precinct today and I left my wallet sitting on my dresser. It's no problem at all. They just fill out this affidavit. And then you as an election inspector put today's date and sign. Now, do... Uh, duties of election inspectors, um, you want to compare the information on the application to vote to the e-poll book. So again, you're looking to make sure that that person's name and address matches 
what's in the ePoll book. You're just looking at the photo identification to see uh, is that person who's standing in front of me and does the name uh, match from the application to vote to their photo identification. You're checking to see if that voter has a red question mark next to their name and then you're issuing them a ballot in the ePoll book and you're talking to the voter or to the election inspector next to you to tell them what the ballot number is and what the voter number is. That person sitting next to you at the list of ballots is going to record the voter number and the ballot number on the voter's application to vote that you just gave to them. They're gonna verify that that really is the next ballot number by looking at the stub on the ballot where the ballot numbers are recorded. They're gonna hand their ballot, the voter the ballot in the secrecy sleeve. If necessary, they're preparing challenged ballots, which we'll get into the whole challenged ballot process and what it means later on. And they're just providing brief verbal instructions on how to mark the ballot. So, you know, darken the box completely next to the candidate of your choice. Now, this is how we make sure that we don't uh, have gaps in the ballots is you go ahead and you pre-fill the ballot secrecy sleeves ahead of time in groups of 30, 20 to 30, to make sure that you don't accidentally issue uh, two ballots. Uh, so basically you go through and you go, oh, I have ballots 101, 102. I skip to 104. Hey, where's ballot 103? You want to check the back of ballot 102 to just see if it got it stuck to it. Um, obviously, humidity probably won't be an issue in November, but you never know. Um, if for some reason, when you're going through uh, the list and you've, you've double checked and know there's really not a ballot there, occasionally this will happen uh, where the printer just skips uh, when they're printing the ballots. In that case, you'll call our office and we'll walk you through uh, what to do so that you can continue on and your numbers will balance at the end of the night. But again, usually what it is, is they just accidentally get stuck and you don't want to accidentally hand a voter a ballot. Because if you missed it, the voters you're likely going to miss it, even when they flip it over to vote the backside of the ballot. And they're going to try to put the two ballots through. And with the two ballots being a little thicker, uh, oftentimes they'll kind of slide apart or they'll be a little thick and that can cause jams at the tabulator. So any voter um, who wishes to register to vote and obtain a ballot can do so up until 8 p.m. on election day, but they have to do it at our office We'll have an office, we have our office here at 301 East Huron. And in addition uh, to our office, we'll have a satellite office that is available um, at UMA, the University of Michigan Modern Art Museum on South State Street, uh, where students can go register to vote on election day if they're not already registered. Um, we've had our satellite office open for going on three weeks now. So we're hopeful uh, that we're really capturing all the students and we're getting them registered ahead of election day. Um, because in March, we, uh, in our office here, we registered 1600 students on election day. And we're trying to make sure that we avoid that same fate come uh, November. But when they come to register on election day or any time within the last 14 days, they have to provide proof of residency. And if they show up in your precinct and you find out that they're not registered to vote, you have a little flyer to hand out to them that shows them exactly what they need to bring when they're registering to vote. And that includes a Michigan driver's license or personal identification card listing their current address. 
a utility bill, a pay stub, a bank statement, or a governmental form or letter. Again, any of these documents can be shown to us electronically. When they show up to either of our two offices, they'll have the option of voting an absentee ballot, or they can return uh, to you, you in the precinct and be issued a ballot. However, uh, we found in uh, March that over 95% of the uh, students that registered here on election day just went ahead and voted here. They weren't going back out to the precinct because if you already stood in line once to the, in the precinct to find out that you weren't registered to vote, to then go stand in line again to register to vote, why are you gonna go stand in line a third time when we're here offering you a ballot without standing in line again? So again, you shouldn't see a lot of these going out to uh, back to you in the precinct once they come register to vote here at City Hall or at UMA. Any voter that registers to vote within the last 14 days will, get, will be given a registration receipt to just prove that they registered in our office within 14 days. Um, so it's after October 19th for this election. So voters who register um, after 4 p.m. on the Monday prior to the election uh, will be given uh, we'll need to be added into that unlisted tab in the e-poll book simply because 4 p.m. on Monday is when we download the list of voters into uh, the e-poll book and the e-poll book is offline so that way it's completely off network and it's incapable of being hacked. Um, so again, anybody that registers after 4 p.m. that wants to come to the precinct and vote will have to be added to the unlisted tab. The receipt will indicate what type of ballot that they're issued, whether it be a regular ballot or a challenge ballot. And we'll get into more detail on what exactly a challenge ballot means, but I will go ahead and tell you now that the vast majority of these individuals will be a challenged ballot, simply because the way that the state law is written is that the only way that you get a regular ballot if you register within the last 14 days prior to the election is if when you register to vote, you come in with a Michigan driver's license or state ID that lists your current address that you're registering at. If you provide proof of residency any other way, you're getting a challenged ballot. So um, most students and people registering within the last 14 days don't have a Michigan driver's license. Uh, so therefore, you're not going to have uh, many regular ballots. The other thing is Prop 3 made it so that uh, we used to have a 30 day hard close of registration. Now with voter registration going up until 8 p.m. on election day, um, you never just wanna turn a voter away without providing them their next step in which, uh, or their next step they should take. And in order to help you with this, again, we recommend setting up kind of a triage table so that you can have voters step aside from the e-poll book and you can work your way through uh, this list. If you have a voter that you've looked in the precinct list, you can't find them. Uh, you've looked in um, the, other listing you can't find them and all possible variations of the name have been tried. You'll wanna pull one of these flow charts out and kind of work through the voters options to see what it is that they should do. Should they try to come register to vote on election day or is there other things that you can do in the precinct to work through it with them. So when you uh, are working at the e poll book, this is the ballot stub. This is where the ballot number is recorded up at the top. This is what's getting entered into the e poll book with the voter's name. So that way we know what ballot number this voter was given. The same information is being recorded on that application to vote. 
So that way we know this is this voter's ballot. The voter takes that application to vote along with a secrecy sleeve and the stub or and the ballot with them. They vote in the uh, precinct or they vote in the voting booth. Then what happens is they get to the person uh, 10 feet away from the tabulator and that person uh, looks at that application to vote. They see what the ballot stub says that ballot should be. They're just uh, having one last double check to say, yes, this voter has ballot number 25. That's what ballot number we assigned to them back at the uh, e-poll book. Perfect. At this point, this stub is going to get torn off. It's just a perforated piece of paper. Once this stub is torn off, the ballot is completely anonymous. As soon as it goes in the uh, tabulator, it's, there's no way of knowing that it's your ballot. We only know that it's your ballot up until the point that we tear the stub off. But you'll tear the stub off, you'll retain the stub on uh, the table in which you're working at, just so that way uh, you have the ability, if you need to, to quickly count how many ballots should have went through the tabulator, just in case you think that you had a jam and somebody's ballot uh, was counted twice, it provides that extra level of being able to count. This is how many ballots we really had. It gives you that extra layer of security. So you just retain these until the end of the night. Once you know that your numbers are balanced, you can simply recycle these. The application of vote, once you've confirmed the number, it goes face up on a little spindle. And then the voter puts their ballot into the tabulator. The secrecy sleeve is designed for them to hold on this little tab here and slide the ballot through uh, this little notch. However, uh, You'll notice that some voters do have issues with this. If you have a voter that's having issues, I always just recommend having the voter take the ballot out of the secrecy sleeve, hold it underneath the secrecy sleeve so that way nobody can see their ballot and just slide it in that way. That way they're not having the secrecy sleeve uh, bind them in any way and it makes life easier for them. <clears throat> You have to be paying attention when you're working this uh, station of both what's going on at the tabulator and also that nobody walks past you with their ballot and just tries to stick it in with the stub attached. Uh, because unfortunately, if they try to stick it in with the stub attached, it can cause jams. So you have to be mindful that nobody tries to skip past this uh, station and just put their ballot in. The other reason you have to be mindful of what's going on at the tabulator is occasionally the tabulator will reject a ballot. There's two reasons the tabulator will reject a ballot. One is for an overvoted ballot. So the voter voted for more uh, individuals or uh, choices in a contest than they're allowed. So in this case for United States Senate, um, too many choices are marked, this contest will not be counted. The other reason would be a blank ballot where there's no votes detected on the ballot. That means the voter either did not make a dark enough mark in the target area, or they truly are trying to cast a blank ballot. Either case, the clerk's office will have provided you with a script to hang right on the side of the tabulator for assisting these voters with errors. Uh, in either choice, they have the way the choice of casting their ballot as is. For an overvoted ballot, all the correctly voted contest will count, just the ones that they overvoted would not count. A blank ballot uh, is going to go through blank and they're going to get credit for voting, but they're not going to, you know, no votes are going to be recorded. If they overvote, they have the option of spoiling their ballot and getting a new one, the blank ballot, they can go ahead, go back to the voting booth and make choices or cast that ballot as is.
<clears throat> now assisting the voters, you have three options when assisting the voters. Uh, first, uh, you can recommend that the voter just uses the voter assist terminal to, you, to mark their ballot. Secondly, uh, two election inspectors of opposite political parties can go ahead and assist a voter. Or finally, the voter is allowed to have anybody that they so wish to um, help them vote as long as they meet a pair of requirements. First, you have to ask the voter if they're requesting assistance to vote by reason of blindness, disability, or inability to read or write. As long as the voter says yes, you have to ask of the person that they chose to assist them. If that person is the voter's employer or agent of that employee or an office officer or agent of the union to which that voter belongs. So you can have anybody help you as long as that person isn't your coworker or a member of your union. And that is in place to prevent uh, your employer or your union from influencing undue influence on the way you vote in the precinct. So yes, inability to read or write would include uh, ability to uh, includes English. So it would be uh, translation accessories. And yes, uh, an agent of your employer would mean uh, your coworkers. So it's it's not just your boss that can't be in there. Uh, your, your boss can't be sending Joe from security to come uh, vote with you. So issuing a ballot for use with the touch writer. Um, so because the touch writer, like I said, it operates as that giant mechanical pencil um, and it prints a brand new ballot for a voter that otherwise physically couldn't mark a ballot on their own. You don't want it to be apparent in any of the places where it is obvious what ballot number a person was assigned that that voter used the touch writer. So you still wanna go ahead and issue that voter a ballot, a, a regular ballot, just like every other voter that comes through the door. You never wanna make any remarks that, hey, uh, Susie voter uses the, used the voter assist terminal. They're just not going to be using that paper ballot that you issued them, but you still wanna record them in the e-poll book because they're still a voter, they vote it. But what you do is once you've issued them their ballot, you're gonna go ahead and tear the stub off that ballot right there at the processing table. On the physical ballot itself, you're just going to write VAT for voter assist terminal. And there'll be a voter assist uh, terminal ballot storage envelope that you'll just put that ballot in. And then you're going to give the voter an empty secrecy sleeve containing that application to vote and that ballot stub. That way, once they're done voting, they print out their new ballot. They can put that ballot in the secrecy sleeve, just like a voter uh, would typically put the ballot in. They'll have a stub for the person 10 feet away from the tabulator to compare to the application to vote. That per the person 10 feet away from the tabulator is just not going to have to say um, that they need to. Uh, they're just not going to have to tear off that stub. It's already going to be torn off. They'll just compare it, you know, keep the stub, put the application to vote on, and then that ballot will go through the voter assist terminal uh, or go through the tabulator like a normal ballot would. The reason we do this is if we identified it, um, it would, if we only had a person use the voter assist terminal during the course of the day, it would be extremely apparent of how that voter voted. So again, your right to a private secret ballot, we wouldn't want to have that infringed upon by identifying you as 
the voter assist terminal ballot and then only having one of them in the tabulator and hey you're the one on the printed paper we know that you're the that's your ballot um <clears throat> i uh, you can always um you you have to be mindful uh that you don't want to assume that a voter has a disability uh, but if a voter asks for assistance in voting you could always recommend that you do have that voter assist terminal that would allow them the independence in voting uh, you never want to just assume that somebody uh, has a disability that would require them to use it and again uh, you don't need to have a disability to use it anybody that so uh, wishes to use it uh, can use it it's just a giant mechanical pencil um, a little bit slower than voting uh, filling in the squares but you know some people do um, want to use it again i would say probably uh, if it gets used once per election per precinct uh, it's uh, it's great <clears throat> now campaigning um, within a hundred feet from the building entrance individuals cannot post display or distribute any election related material so it's your jobs as election inspectors to make sure that nobody comes in with any campaign clothing or accessories uh, so you know it has to be directly related to what's on the ballot so a voter can't come in with their uh, MAGA hat, their Joe Biden face mask, their, um, you know, their face paint, their, their t-shirt with a candidate's name on it, their vote yes on prop three, uh, button, anything like that. Um, if you see a uh, clothing or accessory uh, you can have the voter remove any accessory, flip the t-shirt inside out in the bathroom, um, put a jacket on uh, to cover it, but it cannot be exposed when they're within that 100 feet from the entrance to the building. <clears throat> Absolutely, if they do not comply with removing uh, the equipment or the offending piece of equi uh, clothing, uh, because they're campaigning within the polling of the precinct, they're not eligible to vote. Uh, most people, when you tell them that, they'll go ahead and remove the offending article. Uh, but again, they cannot vote because they're displaying a campaign material uh, within the precinct. Now, the only thing uh, you can have in terms of campaign material inside the precinct is uh, the slate cards. Uh, so the stuff that the campaigners hand you uh, as you're walking in the precinct to get you to vote for their candidates. Uh, voters can carry that with them into the precinct. Uh, just be mindful that they're not, you know, waving it around going, hey, you should vote for uh, you know, this candidate, um, but, uh, and also be mindful that you go ahead and clean all of that up afterwards. Uh, voters don't really want it as they're going into the precinct, so it's very common for them to just leave it in the voting booth afterwards. Um, so, uh, please make sure that you're going through making sure that there's not uh, heaps of uh, voting uh, flyers sitting in a uh, side of voting booth so that way the next voter comes in and you know they're being bombarded with the vote for uh, a candidate that they cannot wear or that they cannot that they don't want um, the other thing, it, while it may sound um, silly, uh, be mindful of what your trash can looks like. Um, 
I, I hate walking into the precinct and, you know, the top of the trash can uh, looks like, uh, you know, a campaign billboard. Uh, so again, if it's in the sight of the voter, just make sure that you're mindful that campaign material is not uh, visible. Again, uh, this is only directly attributed to things that are on the ballot. So again, you couldn't wear like a vote Democrat uh, t-shirt, a vote Republican t-shirt, anything on the ballot. Um, but uh, things like Black Lives Matters, things like that, that aren't on the ballot, aren't directly tied to a party. Yes, a one party above the other is more closely aligned with it, but they can't wear it. Uh, they can't wear a general. Now, where the line starts to get a little bit murky is you could wear a t-shirt for a candidate that's not on the ballot. Um, so you could wear your, uh, as a voter, you could wear your I'm with her Gretchen Whitmer t-shirt because she's not on the ballot. But a just a general vote blue t-shirt wouldn't be acceptable because the Democratic Party is a straight party ticket and is on the ballot. So something like that is where it kind of gets a little bit murky according to state law. <clears throat> um, as long as the t-shirts are, you know, just not directly related to anything on the ballot. So simple, something like vote, that's fine. <clears throat> I typically uh, would not have it be somebody's full-time job to be out there. But again, you have somebody, uh, you have enough people that um, usually uh, if you do have a line, that person, um, uh, going up and down the line can be peeking out the window every, you know, 15, 20 minutes to make sure that the campaigners are being uh, respectful of that hundred foot. Uh, and trust me, your voters will let you know if they're breaking it because they all get annoyed with that hundred foot uh, they know that within 100 feet that they should be left alone. Uh, so if you have an egregious violation, your voters will quickly be letting you know. So again, uh, a voter can campaign, but they have to be outside that 100 foot rule. It's, you can't be within the 100 foot of the building entrance. <clears throat> The only people that are allowed to be within the 100 feet of the entrance uh, doing anything are exit pollsters and exit pollsters are allowed to survey voters after they vote it. They can't question voters going into the polls. Um, again, they're not allowed to enter the building, but they can ask voters after they vote it, who they vote it for to try to get an uh, early results from the election. So this is kind of a popular thing. All right, poll watchers. Anybody may be a poll watcher present in the polling location to observe with the exception of a candidate on the ballot. A candidate on the ballot has to vote and get out of the precinct because them being in the precinct is campaigning. Poll watchers, once the precinct are open, are required to remain in the public area of the precinct. They can't be behind you at the processing table. <clears throat> they can occasionally come and look at the e-poll book, but it'll only be at the discretion of the precinct chairperson 
at times when doing so would not be disruptive to the operation of the precinct. Again, keep in mind, photography in the precinct is limited to the credentialed members of the press from the public area or voters taking a photo of their own ballot in the voting booth. Now, challengers, challengers have additional um, respon uh, responsibilities and rights than poll watchers. Basically, anybody can be a poll watcher, but they have no real uh, obligation or no real, you know, rights. Challengers have rights because they're appointed by political parties or interest groups. They'll be carrying credentials. You'll have a uh, sample of what each of these credentials actually look like. So you can look at a person's credentials and know if they're legitimate or not. For challengers, you can have no more than two per political party or organization uh, actively challenging in your precinct at a time. These challengers have the ability to challenge your compliance on election law. And they also have the ability to challenge the qualification of a voter prior to the person receiving their ballot if they have good reason to believe that that voter is not a resident of the city of Ann Arbor, under the age of 18, not a United States citizen, um, not registered to vote in the precinct or has already voted a absentee ballot in this case, they would go ahead and uh, the way it works is challengers direct the challenge through a, a election inspector. They never direct the challenge directly through a voter. They never speak directly to the voter. The way it works is as long as the voter hasn't already received their ballot, they can say, I'm challenging this voter based on, I don't believe they're 18, I don't think they're a citizen, whatever reason. You'll wanna go ahead, I would have the voter step aside. In your paper poll book, there's an oath that you'll give that voter. Once the voter has taken the oath, you'll ask the voter a simple yes, no question based on the reason why they were challenged. So are you a resident of Ann Arbor? Are you over the age of 18? Are you a United States citizen? Do you reside at X address to prove that they vote in the precinct? Did you vote your absentee ballot? As long as after answering the question, the voter still is eligible to vote, issued a ballot and that ballot goes through the tabulator. If the voter after being challenged either refuses to take the oath or they say, no, I'm not a citizen. No, I'm not 18 years old. Then they cannot be issued a ballot. Again, the challengers are the ones that provi uh, provide good reason. They have to have good reason. Um, if you start to suspect <clears throat> that a uh, good reason is, uh, you know, crossing the line from being, it's becoming apparent that it's no longer random and that it's becoming uh, systemic, that they're doing it to every person of a certain uh, socioeconomic status or a certain, uh, you know, this or that. And in that case, then that's where you'll want to call our office and we'll have the attorneys out that they can come and observe and deal with it that way. Now you have responsibility to uh, challengers, 
you have the right to provide them enough space to work, including behind the processing table. Uh, allowing them, uh, they can't be allowed to touch anything, but they can examine the voting equipment. Whenever they challenge a voter, you have to administer the oath to the person that they're challenging. You have to prepare the ballot of the person they challenge as challenged. And you have to record in the paper poll book that the person was challenged. So to prepare a challenge ballot, what you do is on the back of the paper ballot itself, you record the um, ballot number in pencil, and then you'll have this post-it note tape, then you simply just cover that ballot number in pencil, or you record that, cover that ballot number in post-it note tape. What this allows you to do is the voter's ballot still gonna go through the tabulator just like normal. But if the challenger ever took this to court to say, hey, I don't think Susie voter really did meet the qualifications to be a voter, it would be brought into court. Susie would be well aware that she was, you know, in the court case, but writing the ballot number in pencil and covering it with tape allows us to then, if we need it to, go find Susie's actual ballot and deduct her vote from the vote total. In all my years of doing this, I've never actually seen this occur, but it does just provide that extra layer of security that if we need it to, we could do it. Again, there's no reason, there's no limit on the number of challenges, uh, but uh, again, if you start to see that they're trying to do it as a delay or voter intimidation tactic, and then in that case, that's when you'll wanna call our office and we can have uh, <clears throat> our attorney, uh, team of attorneys come out and observe. Quick rundown of the difference between challengers and poll watchers again, and this is in the election inspector manual, um, but challengers must uh, carry credentials issued by an appointing authority. Um, they have to be registered voters in Michigan and they have the right to challenge a person's eligibility to vote in your actions as election inspectors. Poll watchers have none of those requirements. Challengers can also be behind you at the processing table uh, and they have greater access to the e-poll book, meaning that uh, anytime they ask, as long as it's not a great disruption, that they need to be give, granted access to look at the e-poll book. Um, challengers or poll watchers, on the other hand, have to remain in the public area of the precinct and can only look at the e-poll book uh, when it wouldn't cause delay to the uh, processing the ballots. Neither of them can touch anything or videotape anything in the precinct, but they can be on their cell phones, tablets, or laptops. A lot of times what uh, challengers are also doing is they're doing uh, targeted get out the vote activity. So challengers are on their computer, checking off a list of names as people come in to vote to make sure that, hey, we know that Bobby always votes the way that we want Bobby to vote or you know, for the party that we want to vote based on uh, your campaign contribution history. So therefore, we're looking to make sure that Bobby comes in to vote today because we know Bobby hasn't turned in an absentee ballot so, hey, it's starting to get late. Bobby hasn't come to the polls yet. We're gonna call Bobby to say, hey, we've noticed it's five o'clock. Bobby, you haven't been to the polls yet. Neither of them can wear clothing, buttons, 
They can't set up tables in your precinct. They can't approach voters and talk to them, but they both have the right to be there until the very end when you leave and they have a right to get a copy of the totals tapes. <clears throat> Challengers are most common on campus precincts. And for this election, the most common place that they're going to be is here with me <clears throat> in the absentee count board. <clears throat> yes, uh, poll work, uh, challengers, much like poll workers and poll watchers are all required to wear a mask. The only individuals not required to wear a mask are uh, voters. <clears throat> Voter intimidation is a completely different story. Again, that's where you would wanna call us and we'd have the attorneys. Um, no, uh, voters, poll watchers, et cetera, cannot open carry in the precinct. Um, Secretary of State just came out in conjunction with the attorney general last yesterday. Uh, formally outline open carry uh, within a hundred feet of the entrance to uh, precincts. Um, waiting to see if there's a legal challenge to that or not. So that may be something that you see additional details, but as of now, uh, voters and poll watchers are not allowed to open carry in the precinct and concealed carry is not allowed in places that already discourage or do not allow closed carry or concealed carry, uh, which would be the majority of places that polling locations are, you know, schools, churches, university buildings. So at this point, uh, the only individuals that are allowed to have guns in precincts are uh, law enforcement officials. <clears throat> so closing of the polls at 8 p.m., you must announce that the polls are officially closed. However, if anybody is still in line, you do have to permit that person in line at 8 p.m to per, uh, vote, what I recommend you do is you gather up all the applications to vote uh, that are standing or sitting on that table and pass them out to the people standing in line at 8 p.m. That way you know everybody that has an application to vote. Uh, when they get to the e-poll book was in line at 8 p.m. If they don't have an application to vote, they showed up at 8.01. And you're not trying to keep track of, you know, the last person in line. It just makes your life easier. Only once the last voter has tabulated their ballot, do you wanna start breaking down the uh, uh, precinct? So don't start taking down voting booths when there's still somebody in the one next to it. It's disruptive to the voting process. Again, keep the doors to the precinct unlocked during the entire time you're there, because again, anybody interested in observing the process does have the right to do so. The first thing you wanna do when you go to close is verify that your tabulator counts right. And this would be done after you've processed any ballots in your auxiliary compartment, which is again, is rare that you have to do this. But what you do is on your tabulator in the center, it'll show how many ballots went through the machine. You don't care about the sheets or the lifetime count. You only care about how many ballots. And you'll compare this number to the list of voters in the e-poll book um, to make sure that this number matches your list of voters in the e-poll book. <clears throat> There's only two reasons that this number wouldn't match your list of voters in the e-poll book, where this number would be lower. Uh, it would be if you had somebody that was given a provisional envelope ballot that did not go through the tabulator, or you had somebody whose ballot was rejected. Now there's only three reasons you ever reject a ballot. 
Uh, the first is for the person that's intentionally campaigning in the precinct after you give them the ballot, you know, and I do mean egregiously campaigning, the jumping up and down, shouting, I voted for, I voted for, by God, I voted for. If you can get the ballot away from them prior to them putting their ballot in the tabulator, then in that case, because they've campaigned, they lose their right to vote in that election. The second reason is when they get to that person 10 feet away from the tabulator, their ballot either doesn't have a stub or the stub is absolutely not the stub that was assigned in the e-poll book and there's no excl explanation of why that is. <clears throat> then in that case, because we know that that was not the ballot that we gave that voter when they walked in the door, then you wouldn't allow that voter to vote because there's been funny business that has gone on with their ballot. And lastly, again, this isn't something that will probably happen in a presidential election. It's more of a uh, August when they couldn't, uh, you know, vote both Democratic and Republican. Um, they get so fed up with the process that they just storm out without putting their ballot through the tabulator. In that case, again, they lose their right to vote for that election because they've just walked off with their ballot or left their ballot in the voting booth. But those are the only three reasons you ever reject a ballot. You'll wanna keep a, uh, make a note of this number because you'll need it in a few places as you go about closing. <clears throat> the first step in closing the polls in the electronic poll book is to complete one last backup. Uh, to back up, you want to back up the computer at least every 15 minutes or so, so that way you're saving all the data onto the flash drive in the event that your computer uh, breaks down during the course of the day. Again, I would hate to see you have to go through and enter all those voters back into the system while also trying to process new voters. So again, saving a file of your uh, work is always important. You would never write a nice long paper without saving. So again, it's the same idea. Never want to process a ton of voters without saving every 15 minutes or so. You just go file back up or in the lower right hand corner of the uh, e-poll book screen, it's going to flash back up overdue. You can click there. But from there, you move on to saving four reports. Those four reports are ballot summary report, list of voters, remarks, and voter history. To complete the ballot summary report, you click reports, you click ballot summary. Line A is the total number of ballots delivered to the polls at the opening of close, uh, opening of the day. This number will automatically be set for you, and that's the total number of ballots you'll have to account for at the end of the night. Line B is going to be zero because we don't process absentee ballots at the end of the night. So line C is the total number of ballots that you have to account for. Line D is that number that you take directly from the tabulator of how many ballots went through your tabulator. Line E will automatically be set to zero, again, because you didn't put any tabulators in or any absentee ballots into the tabulator. Line F is the total number of ballots that are spoiled and reissued. So every time you spoil and reissue a ballot, this number automatically keeps track for you. Line G is the total number of ballots that are rejected. And again, the system automatically keeps track. Line H is the no number of ballots used for duplication. And 99.9% .9 of the time, this is zero. The only reason you would ever have to duplicate a ballot in the precinct is if there was a comedy of errors in which one, your tabulator broke down during the course of the day, and two, during the course of it being down and voters putting their ballot into the auxiliary bin, there was also a printing defect on some of those ballots. So at 8 p.m. when you're going to put those voted ballots into the machine, uh, some of them will not go through because of printing defects on them. In that case, two election inspectors of opposite political parties would have to duplicate them onto ballots that did not have issues. So again, 99.99% .99 of the time, that's going to be zero. 
Line I, total number of provisional ballot envelope ballots issued. So ballots that don't go through the tabulator uh, will automatically be kept track of. Line J, again, at the end of the night, this will automatically be filled in for you like you used zero ballots. So your starting number and ending number will be pre-filled in. All you have to do is change your starting number in line J. And what you do is you look at the stack of ballots next to the e poll book and whatever the next ballot number you would have issued is, that's what you change your starting number to. You don't touch the ending number. Once you do that, you're gonna click in any of the white boxes above and line L should then be zero. And then you'll click preview down at the bottom to go ahead and save the report. When you click preview, it's gonna pop up a little screen that shows it as a nice one page document. And you'll just click the little floppy disk icon in the upper left hand corner. And then you'll say PDF. It's automatically going to go to save onto the flash drive, which is great. So then you'll just go ahead and click save. From there, it's all downhill, smooth sailing. You just close out, you go to reports, list of voters, which is going to be a many pages long list of all the voters that came into your precinct in order. And again, you just click that floppy disk in the upper left-hand corner and then the PDF icon. Saving it onto that flash drive again and you'll click save. Same with your remarks. So every time you make a remark on a voter or a general remark, it gets saved. And you just need to save that by again, going to report remarks, clicking that floppy disk in the upper right hand corner, clicking PDF, and then clicking save. The last thing you have to save, which kind of tricks people up because this isn't under reports, this is under file, is file save history. And what this allows us to do is easily update your voter history to show that you voted in the precinct on election day. So again, it'll automatically default to saving on the flash drive. And you just click save. You just wanna verify that you have all five <clears throat> reports. To do that, you click on the Windows Home icon and you click on the little piece of paper, you'll see the USB drive and you just double click on that USB drive and you're just looking for these five files, which is uh, your report ballot summary, your EPB ACCDB, which is your backup throughout the course of the day, your EPB history, your report voter, uh, lit, voter list and your report remarks. From there, it's time to close the tabulator to do so, you go ahead and unspool that tape that you tucked away safely in the morning, making sure that you pull it all the way past the last line of signatures from the morning so that you don't print over top of that report. Then you'll press the blue uh, poll worker button on the back of the tabulator to access the main menu. You'll choose close polls. The tabulator will ask you to confirm that you wish to close the polls. You'll say yes, close the polls. You'll enter your closed polls password. Again, this uh, password will be located in your important document envelope on a sheet of paper that looks much like this. What's going to happen is it's going to print one copy of your totals tape. <clears throat> From there, um, it's going to try to transmit your results down to Washtenaw County. As long as it's successful, it's automatically going to print a uh, transmission report that lets you know this. If it fails, we ask that you retry that report one time. If it still fails after a second time, Uh, then you go ahead and hit cancel. All that means 
the election results are still safely on the flash drive. It just means that the results aren't being uploaded into the Washtenaw County website right away. Just means people can't see your results of the election uh, in real time. It's perfectly fine. After the transmission report is done, it's gonna go ahead and print three more copies of your totals tapes and all elections inspectors present will sign each of these tapes. Once it's done printing that last tape, it's going to switch to the screen that shows the polls are closed. That's going to be your cue that it's now time to finally tear that tape off from the tabulator and put it into your return to local clerk envelope for transport back to City Hall at the end of the night. We're expecting that we'll have statewide write-in candidates. And also we know for sure that we have a write-in candidate uh, in the first ward for city council. So we're requesting that each precinct print the write-in report, which you just press the button. And what that's going to do is every time an individual fills in the box next to a write-in, it the um, tabulator captures an image of what they put in the space next to it and it's going to physically print out what they put in that box next to it. You'll use that tape to complete the write-in statement of votes. We'll provide you with a list of ballot write-ins and you'll only need to look at the tape for ballot write-ins. So you'll look at the race. Uh, so say we have a uh, ballot write-in for representative in Congress You'll scroll to representative in Congress on the tape and say Joe Smith is running for representative in Congress. Every time you see Joe Smith's name appear on that tape, you'll make a tally on this statement of votes recording that Joe Smith got a vote. Now, if Joe Smith's name shows up as Joseph Smith, you'll record that it also showed up as Joseph Smith and record each time it shows up as that variation. So any variation of a candidate's name that you think could easily be attributed to that candidate, you wanna record it on a separate line and make a tally each time that name shows up. What you don't need to worry about is all the random things that people write in on their ballots. So all the cookie monsters, Donald Ducks, uh, Mickey Mouses and random things that you will see on this report at the end of the night and it never ceases to amaze me, um, the random things that you will see. <clears throat> so yes, even if it's one letter off, um, you would have to go in and write uh, each variation of the person's name. So if they had spelt it J-O-S-E-P-H instead of J-O-E-S-P-H, you would record that uh, as a line. Uh, my favorite example of this is back when uh, Detroit Mayor Dugan was running. There was close to, I want to say, 500 different examples of uh, write-ins, acceptable write-ins variations that were attributed to him. Now, at the end of the night, uh, all unused ballots will be placed back in one ballot container. All your voted ballots will be placed into a second ballot container. Uh, you'll have these envelopes for your various different uh, ballots that you use throughout the course of the day if you had to. So if you had any spoiled ballots, you'll put it in this uh, purple folder. If you had to duplicate any ballots, you'll put it in these original ballots. Uh, any surrendered absentee ballots will go in this orange folder. Any voter assist terminal ballots will go in this black folder. But these folders or these envelopes will all get sealed with your voted ballots. The only form, uh, only ballots that aren't sealed up at the end of the night are provisional ballot, uh, provisional envelope ballots because those need to come back to City Hall for processing separately. <clears throat> Inside your front pocket of your zippered notebook, you'll have these. Uh, Vinyl pouches, one will contain a white cardstock for your unvoted ballots. One will contain a blue cardstock for your voted ballots. 
And basically what you do is you record the seal number off this blue pull tight seal, which will be inside. There'll be two in each of the containers. The second one is only in case you accidentally break a seal. But you record that seal number and then a Republican and a Democratic uh, Democrat in signs saying that this is the seal number that we use to seal this bag. Each of the ballot bags, depend, uh, regardless of what type they are, have zippers that come together with a grommet in between to make sure that they're very tightly secured and that nothing can be inserted in between them. And that is where that blue pull tight seal will go. Uh, finally, you'll go ahead and uh, close out the tabulator. You'll press the little blue pull worker button on the back to close that out. Uh, up at the top of the screen, you'll hit menu because it's going to try to do some other pull worker tasks because this isn't designed to just open and close. From there, you'll choose close polls. It's going to ask you uh, to confirm that you really want to close the polls. You'll just say yes. It's going to print a little uh, closing tape just showing how many times it was used. Uh, all the election inspectors will sign it and it will go in one uh, the local clerk receiving board envelopes. At this point, this is where you finally cut those blue plastic seals that have been holding your memory cards in place uh, in both your tabulator and your voter assist terminal. And you'll have this lovely blue uh, bag from the county that those two flash drives along with the flash drive from your e-poll book will be uh, sealed inside to be brought back to City Hall. Inside this pouch on election day, there'll be another one of those vinyl pouches containing a green card that again, you'll record the seal number, a Democrat and a Republican will sign. In your paper poll book, there's a certificate of election inspector form that needs to be filled out. You start by recording the total number of ballots according to your tabulator, the total number of ballots according to your e-poll book. If you have any provisional envelope ballots, that goes on line number two. You then just work through and check off all the boxes as you complete the activities. You'll record the seal number from your ballot bag containing your voted ballots, your unvoted ballots, that blue memory card ballot bag, a Democrat and a Republican will sign, and then all the election inspectors present at the close of polls will sign below. If you're in one of the precincts that has 13 election inspectors, they're just gonna have to sign in the white space down below. From there, you're gonna start putting the important forms to come back to City Hall into this two local clerk receiving board envelope. And that's going to be your poll book, that zero tape with all three totals tapes attached. So the uh, tape that your tabulator um, generates, that write-in report tape. We provide you with an opening checkoff list to help you. So that opening checkoff list, the way it's designed is it tells you exactly what page of the manual to go look to see, hey, I have questions about this process. Uh, what page do I turn to in the manual to help me? You have a voter ID tally sheet to say, these are how many people did not have uh, photo identification. You have a problem sheet. So that way, if there's any voter registration problems, you can notate it there. Uh, you have a notes to Jackie, Jennifer, and myself. So you can write us notes on things you would like to see improvements on. A precinct reconciliation form is a form that every two hours you can look and see. My e-poll book says I have this many voters. I have this many voters in the voting booth currently with ballots. My tabulator says I should have this many ballots. Do my numbers line up? Any completed voter registration applications. This is where your provisional ballots would go. Your completed flow charts. Your applications to vote will go in here. Those affidavits of absent voters will go in here. Your timesheets. And again, at the end of the night, we give you a closing checkoff list to help you with closing directly tied in to your election inspector manual. Delivering of the documents, one Republican, 
election inspector and one Democratic election inspector uh, will deliver the following documents to City Hall. Uh, your sealed local clerk receiving board envelope, your zippered notebook with the keys to the tabulator, and your sealed large blue canvas ballot bag, which is that, and your EPB laptop. All right. So it's one o'clock. At this point, that concludes the presentation. I will just be going through and clearing out questions. So if anybody has any last minute questions uh, and wants to stick around as I go through and answer um, questions, uh, I can do so now. <clears throat> uh, you'll store your personal property uh, behind the processing table. That way it's you know not really accessible uh, for voters. Uh, you'll rotate throughout the course of the day um, through the various jobs. Uh, no, there's no chance that uh, if you were assigned to the apps, uh, to the precinct that you'll be switched to the absentee count board um, that you'll or that you were assigned to the precinct that you'll be switched to the absentee count board the absentee count board is uh, well staffed <clears throat> walking up and down the line to make sure everyone is registered to vote yes uh, in a lot of our precincts and all of our precincts that have multiple uh, uh, precincts in them um, we have a tablet that allows you to look to make sure that they're standing one in the right place and two uh, that they have that they're registered. It's basically a stripped down version of the e poll book where it doesn't have any personal information in it, but it would allow you to look up and kind of start to troubleshoot ahead of time. It's only if somebody comes in to register to vote within the last 14 days uh, that they would receive a challenge ballot. If they're showing up to vote and they're already registered in your precinct, you don't care what the address on their driver's license says. Uh, it's only when they're registering to vote that they would receive that challenge ballot within the last 14 days. Unfortunately, no, the QVF is not uh, sophisticated enough to allow you to um, search by uh, last name. So, uh, or search by uh, address. Uh, if you have somebody that you want to look up by address, you would have to call our office and we can do it by address there. Uh, if somebody's non-compliant with taking photos, things like that. First, I would always just try to talk to them if they're being you know, extremely uh, belligerent about it. That's when you'll want to call our office. Uh, the uh, manual, again, is designed to be a reference guide for you. No, I'm not expecting you to read all um, 155 pages uh, prior to um, election day. Uh, yes, the slides from today will be sent out as a PDF along with the recording of today's presentation, um, probably uh, a week or so from now. Uh, we ask that poll workers, you know, uh, dress in non, you know, something that looks appropriate, uh, but again, be comfortable because it is a longer day. Um, I can't always guarantee who's going to be running the reports in the e-poll book at the end of the night. Um, it just depends on who's most comfortable with the computer at the end of the night. Uh, sometimes it'll be the chairperson. Sometimes there's other e-poll book people. Uh, but again, uh, the important document envelope is either just a uh, gray or yellow envelope, but on it in big bold letters as it says important documents open first so it's very very uh, obvious that it's it's yours um, again like i've stressed before i understand that this is a lot of um, information to be thrown at you uh, but you'll find out uh, once you get to the precinct that it's much easier in person to start doing and that yes there is a, a large support 
um, network. Uh, Um, no, likely um, we won't be releasing uh, election inspectors simply because uh, once we have people sign in the morning that they were there for this opening of the polls, uh, the county likes to see the same people's names at the end of the, uh, the night for closing of the polls, uh, paperwork reasons, it just makes life uh, that much simpler. Uh, verifying that the voter is in the correct precinct, uh, so if they're in your list of voters, that means they're in your precinct. Uh, so that's how <clears throat> Yes, if you're registered to vote uh, or if you're working in the precinct that you're registered in, uh, you could vote in your precinct during the course of the day if there's a slow moment. I always recommend that absentee vote or that uh, workers vote by absentee just so that you don't have to worry about trying to vote on election day. So if there's a disruption, uh, you want to call our office again, uh, I mean, general public, once they're done voting, they basically become poll watchers. The first person you would want to ask about any questions that you have on election day would be your chairperson. Yes, absolutely. Um, so you get two um, paid hour breaks. And during those two hour paid breaks, I really recommend getting out of the precinct, getting some fresh air, taking your lunches, uh, taking your dinners, uh, and getting out of the precinct. Uh, so leave the precinct and go away. Um, being a student election inspector and an adult election inspector, nothing really different except uh, your break times are set for you. Um, and you have to be out by 10 p.m. Uh, yes, you can be on your phone, but please be mindful if voters walk in to quickly put them away. So the way it works for breaks is we provide a suggested break schedule and usually your chair people will have you sign up ahead of time uh, so that you know early on in the morning uh, what it says. Uh, yep, all the instructions on operating the VAT machine are in uh, the machine, you can bring a cooler for snacks and lunch and um, oh, you'll have more than enough people to take your bathroom breaks and lunch breaks and, you know. So the way the identification for your chair people will work is uh, all election inspectors will have um, uh, hi, my name is election inspector, uh, basically sticky tags. Uh, your chair people will have a uh, more substantial uh, physical badge. Uh, food is not provided, unfortunately, just with the sheer volume of 53 precincts, it's not a uh, practical. Uh, and, and uh, finally, um, uh, two questions. No, unfortunately, we're no longer uh, recruiting uh, elections inspectors. Um, and yes, your chairperson will reach out to you um, the, usually the weekend prior to, uh, at worst, uh, the night before the election to let you know. Um, they'll be covering all the basics of where do you park? How do you get into the precinct? Um, you know, and just introducing themselves to you. So yes, your chairperson uh, will reach out to you. Uh, with that, I'm sorry that we ran over a little bit, uh, but I do appreciate all the great questions today. 
Uh, everybody, thank you for taking time out of your Saturday. Uh, have a wonderful uh, rest of your day. And I look forward to seeing you all on election day.